Hi, everyone. Welcome to the IDA documentary screening series. My name is Ruzel Castillo. I'm the Public Programs and Events Manager here at the IDA. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to have a great conversation with the Director of President Camila Nielsen, moderated by Shaniqua McClendon of Crooked Media. I like to offer land acknowledgement coming from Los Angeles on the unceded land of the Chumash and Tongva people who have been stewards of this land for generations. I also like to thank our media sponsor, IndieWire, for helping us bring this series to you. We have a little more than a month left of documentaries, and you can check out our upcoming screenings on our website at www.documentary.org screening dash series. We have virtual screenings available to IDA members through December 10th. Now I'm going to hand things over to Shaniqua to get this conversation started. Shaniqua, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have a great discussion ahead of us about the documentary film President. Um, and so I'm just gonna jump right in and invite Camila Nielsen, uh, the film's director to the stage so we can discuss it. Hi Camila, how are you today? Hi, yeah, nice to see you. I'm you fine, too. glad to be here. Absolutely. Um, well, as I said in the intro, um, I thought the film was amazing. Um, I, I said, oh my goodness, I can't believe this so many times while I was watching it, just kind of getting frustrated. Um, and so, you know, just thank you and congratulations for making such an amazing film. Um, and so I'm just gonna jump right in with probably the question you always get. Uh, you know, what was kind of your inspiration for, for making this film? But a little specifically, I'd like to ask about the timing. We see when the film opens um, that Nelson is running for president because the candidate who was supposed to be running passed away from cancer. And so I just wondered, did you, hop into the film right when that happened or had you been there sooner and just chose to, to focus it uh, from the start at that moment? Um, well, the story about President is that I'd made a film previously in Zimbabwe called Democrats, where I filmed as the country wrote its first democratic constitution. Uh, it was a very long process. We filmed for over three years um, and uh, the film took five years to make and then was subsequently banned by former President Mugabe and his censorship board. And, uh, and of course, that was a devastating for, for us that the, the, the film couldn't be screened in the country where it mattered most. And so some of the lawyers, some of the country's finest lawyers, whom I had filmed in the making of Democrats as they wrote the, the constitution for the country, they suggested that we challenge that ban in the Zimbabwean courts because it was uh, idiosyncratic uh, for them that a film about a democratic constitution in which there was a chapter of freedom of speech was then banned by the president and his censorship board. And in that sense, kind of already violated the new constitution before it had even turned into law. So, so, uh, so to cut a long story short, basically it was a two and a half year court challenge which we won in early 2018. By then, Mugabe had just been ousted in a military coup. And when I flew back to uh, be part of the hearing for the banning case, um, that's when the idea to make president came uh, to the table. We, uh, we won the banning case, I should say, and were able to free the film for, for distribution in Zimbabwe. And we had a small celebration dinner with the protagonist of my first film. And they then said, look, it was such a tragic ending to Democrats. Why don't you come back now? We're about to have a presidential election and film that process. And maybe you'll have a, a happy end to the film this time. So that's how president came about. Oh. It wasn't my idea. Um, I was in the middle of another project, uh, but um, but the opportunity to, to, to get the story right was just too, too great a chance for me to, to pass on. So, so that's the story behind President. Wow, um, I was gonna ask uh, beforehand uh, how much you knew going into it, but it sounds like you know a lot because you had um, filmed uh, or done this other film. Um, did, did you get a response out of uh, Zimbabweans about your first film uh, or even this one? 
Um, well, the, the funny thing is that when we finally were able to unban Democrats and we had we posted the happy news on the website and I wrote, you know, we're finally able to distribute the film in, in Zimbabwe, it turned out that most of the population had already seen it. Oh. Uh, the ban it, itself was actually had been sort of a, a good uh, advertisement for the film because when you live in a dictatorship and you don't agree with your government, when they ban a film, you want to see what it's about. And uh, it turned out that there had been a, a illegal uh, distribution of Democrats across the country. There was even a website you could post and send an envelope and they would send you a, a DVD with a film. So, so it has been widely distributed um, and, uh, and uh, we are still waiting to, to distribute the president, but we'll do a, a double distribution of both films uh, early next year for schools and universities and, and everyone who, who cares to see it. Okay, well, I, I will try to find out where I can watch Democrats because that sounds like it's also an amazing film. Um, so, you know, throughout the film, again, I just kept saying, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening. Like, how is this happening? And you catch what I think is a lot of damning footage of um, the ZANU party and just kind of doing whatever they need to win. At any point, did the party, the government, or even the um, electoral commission know that you all were making this film? Um, I, I guess I'm asking this because it just seemed to me that like, if I was trying to get away with something, I would not do things so blatantly with cameras there, but I wonder if they knew that you were there. Yes, of course, because to be able to film in Zimbabwe, you need official filming permits. So uh, we applied for uh, a new permit to, to make president and we were given it by the Ministry of Information, um, which I would say to my surprise, we're happy to have us back and, and make another film in the country. I think, you know, when we started filming president, uh, uh, the new government, Murangakwa's governments and, and Sanu PF, um, were uh, take, going to very great lengths to show to especially the international community that times had changed, that this was a new dispensation, that the days of the dictatorial rule under Mugabe had gone, and that this was an open, free, and now fully democratic society. And there was a lot of attention also on Zimbabwe at that moment around the election, because it was the first presidential election without Mugabe on the ballot paper. There was great hope for change. I think within the general Zimbabwean society, there was a feeling that now was the chance. And there was also a great sort of international attention to, to, to the situation in Zimbabwe. There were 40 different election observer teams from all over the, the, the world who came to observe the, the nation. There was more international press than I've seen at any election anywhere. Um, and I think that perhaps we were given a second permission because it wouldn't have looked good to have denied us in, 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 in a time where they really tried with, with, with every tool in the toolbox to showcase this new so-called democracy. But yeah. other than that, it's difficult for me to speculate uh, as to the government's uh, reasoning for, for having us make the film. But of course, we are, we are very thankful that we were given permits to, to make the film. Um, yeah. Yeah, and while you were there, um, you know, uh, in addition to what I thought was pretty uh, kind of damning footage, you also are there during a lot of violence. What was it like to kind of be there in those moments and capturing, uh, one, a very dangerous situation, but also something that really helped tell the story that you were trying to tell about the, the links that, um, you know, the people were willing to go to have a, a Free, fair, and elect, free and fair election and, and open democracy, but also the lengths that the government was willing to go to, to have it go the, the way that they wanted. Um, you know, what the, the, I think you're referring to a particular scene in the film where violence uh, erupted in the, in the street. Yeah. Um, the military, yeah. Yeah, well, the, you know, there's been a, a history of rigged elections in Zimbabwe, and usually the pattern has been that after election day, either the ballot boxes have been missing or the counting has been delayed for days or sometimes weeks, in some one case, even for months. And so as the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission um, were very slow to come with the official result, there was tension in the population. It was like the people was feeling that this is a deja vu. We, we've seen this before and it's, it's not a good sign. 
So a group of young people had gathered outside the, the, the hotel where the electoral commissioner is based. And it was during a time where the international uh, election uh, observer teams were having a, a press conference and they were trying to put pressure on the international observers to say, please this time, make sure that this is free, fair and transparent. And in those gatherings of, of young people, there was, you know, it was a volatile situation. Somebody lit a fire, another person threw a stone. And I think the reaction then from the regime was a bit of an overreaction. Uh, there was water cannons, there were uh, tear gas uh, thrown at them. And this then erupted in, a, in an already tense situation into what I would say within 20 minutes looked like more like a civil war was taking place in, in Harare, in, in, in the capital. And well, we came to film an election, we came to you know, a newborn uh, democracy, or that's how it had been declared. I was skeptical, but you know, we left our minds open. At least we didn't bring bulletproof West or yeah. uh, hats or any other thing that you would have brought for, for, for a conflict uh, area for if you went to, to film some kind of a, a war situation. So we were totally unprepared, as were the international journalists on the, the spot. Um, and I should say that the, the scene in the film with, with the violence um, is compiled by footage from eight different camera people. Uh, it's, it's our footage, but it's also other Zimbabwean cinematographers and journalists uh, who were on the street. Because as soon as, as we realized that the, this was live bullets and people were bleeding and dying on the ground before us, obviously we we had to put the camera down and, and, and go into hiding behind a, a car. I think we did, but it was, yeah. it was very, it came out of nowhere and it was very surprised and, and it was shocking uh, that it, it went to that extent on a, a, just a few days after the election. Yeah, um, it's, you know, it's, I didn't realize, I thought it was kind of um, a creative decision to juxtapose the um, uh, press conference that was going on with the violence in the streets. I did not realize that it was actually happening at the same time. Wow. And wow. That, so now I'm wondering, you know, this, um, this observation mission, did you, did you have any other encounters with them other than kind of this press conference they were doing? And what was your sense of them actually being there? You know, in the United States, we talk about, a lot about checks and balances. And I think that we have seen here over, you know, since 2016 that checks and balances are only as good as the people who are willing to honor them. Um, and, you know, they have failed here. And, and I wonder, you know, what was happening with this mission uh, and the observers, because I really thought, okay, there's no way that they are oblivious to all of this that's going on. And now you've just shared that the, um, you know, the violence that erupted was actually happening right outside. So, you know, did you get the sense that they were there for a reason, like a real reason, or just kind of to, to send a message? Yeah, it's a very important question, I think. Um, we actually tried to film with some of the uh, the observer teams. We we talked to the EU observer team head of, of mission to see if we could film some of their work. Um, as, as a member of the international community, I felt that would be relevant to, to, to show in the movie. But uh, it was not possible. There was a lot of secrecy about what, what, what they were doing and, and our request was declined. Um, frankly, my, 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 my comment to this is that, that in my book, I think the international community let Zimbabwe down big time in this presidential election. And, and the main people who did that was the observer teams who came to, to make sure that this was a transparent, free and fair election. Um, given the history of, of rigging of election uh, in Zimbabwe, there's a very refined machinery, a very, uh, I could say, experienced methodology to how to do this, which I think the observer teams couldn't have had, you know, better knowledge about and have investigated further. I also feel that there was so much hope for this to be a free and fair election and for a new democracy to be born, that when things started to get muddy, um, it was like the international community didn't want to say, yes, it's free or fair, or no, it's not free or fair. Uh, and I think the, 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 the fact that, that the international community was there, in a way, then helped Munangagwa, the current president, to re legitimize his election, because he can now say, you might claim that this election was stolen, 
but there were 40 teams from all over the world. None of them has released a report saying this was not free and fair. There's been reports, but they are, you know, compromised, I'd say, uh, to, to say the least. They're not clear. And for me, you, it's, it's a, you can only have a free or fair election, or it's not an, or free or fair election. It can't be yeah. in between. And there is, unfortunately, and I think Chamisa mentions that in, in the film too, there is this idea that if, if, if an election in Zimbabwe is not too bloody, not too many people are killed, reasonably okay in terms of numbers, let's just say it's okay. And, and there is a need, I think, to align these election standards internationally. Why, why, why should an election there not live up to the same standards that we have here in Denmark, where I'm from? And I give you an example very quickly. There was six preconditions before the election was held that needed to be fulfilled to have a free and fair election. One was an official voters role. Uh, that did not happen. One was control with how many ballot papers were printed. That did not happen. One was assurance that the election committee was unbiased now and, and, and free of the history of supporting the ruling party. That did not uh, happen. One was a media environment that was not just state media, which was bombarding Chamisa as the devil on the front page every day. I could go on and on and on. And I think if we had looked at these preconditions, the election shouldn't have taken place in the first place. Um, so, so in, in, in every way, I think the international community completely lets the Zimbabwean people down. It was not the will of the people uh, that was expressed in this election. And when things got difficult and complicated, everybody took their passport and, and sort of flew back home. And, and in this way, my, my claim is that if that's the level of engagement we have as international observers, part of the international community, maybe we should not come at all because in fact we are helping to legitimize authoritarian regimes like that of Munangakwa and I think it's a big problem. Yeah, um, you know, I, you mentioned earlier uh, that Zimbabwe wanted to really demonstrate to the international community that this was a legitimate election um, and I could be speaking solely for myself right now, but, um, you know, and it could be because I work in politics here. And so I, I didn't have the bandwidth to see what was going on in other countries. But, you know, whenever I've gone out of the country and I watch the news, international news covers um, American politics. And I just, I, I didn't see anything about this election. And watching your film, it's very clear that a lot was going on, a lot was at stake. And, you know, this election was the result of a coup. So, you know, do you have any thoughts as to why, for instance, the 2008 election in the United States, the 2016 election got a ton of attention, why um, other countries weren't seeing what was going on in Zimbabwe? Because, it, you know, governments in other countries intervene in a lot of things that maybe they shouldn't. But if we are really, um, you know, champions of democracy, this seemed like a really easy uh, place to, to try to get involved and offer support to, to the voters. It, it's a big question for me too. I, I, I think that um, basically Robert Mugabe, the former president, has been a, a, a problem child in terms of Western governments. Uh, yeah. I think he fought for, for, for a long time for, you know, for very good reasons for, for proper independence of Africa. I think a lot of decolonization was about giving each state a, you know, an ethno anthem and a new flag. And then, you know, the colonizers left and left the new governments to, to deal on things with their own. And I think in, in the early years of Mugabe rule, I think he did a, a really wonderful job in, in, in trying to oppose uh, that, you know, in terms of natural resources, in terms of economics, that this was not just a political freedom, but an economic freedom, a, you know, a complete independence which I would claim is still not there in, in terms of Zimbabwe. And I think that's a key to, 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 to answer your question. Zimbabwe has a lot of natural resources, diamonds, gold, lithium, more than 60 resources that, that we are plunging here from, from, uh, from the Western part of the, the, the world. Um, and uh, some people are actively speculating in keeping Zimbabwe a conflict area, because that means that you can sort of relatively easy keep uh, uh, pulling resources up from the underground. Um, 
I'd say other people, other other governments, uh, and I, I, I shouldn't be specific here, but um, some people aligned themselves with Munangakwa's government, thinking that he has governmental experience. He's been, uh, you know, part of the state machinery before. They were very nervous that Chemiza was 41 years old, was an unproven politician who had just sort of had to step up and fill the shoes of, of Morgan Changarai, and was he able to do it? Uh, that was a big question mark. And I think uh, the passing of Changarai sort of left everyone with what now? You know, Mugabe is gone. Everybody wanted a democratically elected government, but the big iconic democratic icon, the people's president, Changarai, passed away so close to the election. And Chamisa had three months to build uh, an election campaign and, and make a name for himself. And I think there was perhaps not a lot of trust in him being capable of one, running the country, and two, clearing the mess after 40 years of misrule with Mugabe. And therefore, I think there was maybe sort of a, you know, let's let's give Munangabe a, a, a chance. It's not that the election, you know, of course, the international community has any say in how the people vote, but they have a say in how hard they push questions about the election's legitimacy. And I might be controversial to say this, but I think it suited certain governments well that Sanofi have stayed in power for, yeah. for all the reasons I just outlined. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and I mean, that sounds like it makes sense to me, um, but I can see how people might might be upset about that. Um, so aside from kind of the central individual figures in the film, um, you know, the, the press seemed to play a huge role here, or even thinking about um, the MDC party, leveraging the press to kind of get their message out. You know, uh, I, I really thought they were not going to release their internal results when the ZEC or the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission said like, you can't do this. And then they were like, okay, we're gonna do this. And, and even at the press conference or uh, the, um, uh, when they were releasing the uh, results and, and had a 60 minute adjournment and they just like go to the stage. Um, how do you think the, well, and to kind of go back to something else you said, were all of those press state press or were there any independent press in there? And how do you think the presence of the press and kind of the way the party used the press um, had an impact on the election? And I know it didn't turn out well for them, but if it had an impact on kind of reaching voters and, and getting them more aware of what was going on. Well, uh, there's, there's one television station in, in Zimbabwe, the ZBC, and they are sort of the mouthpiece of the, the ruling party, uh, Sano PF. Um, there has been, uh, there was during the election and after the fall of Mugabe, sort of a flowering of independent press, a lot of young people who grabbed their phone and, and you know, started to, to cover politics uh, because there was a sense of the space opening up. And I think you can see in, in, in the film, in, in, you know, before the election day and running up to the election, the, the, the press room at the opposition headquarters is packed, uh, both with local press uh, um, and, and also some international press. And, and around the election day itself, there's, I think you could see at Mugabe's press conference, there's maybe 300 microphones on the table, yeah. almost bellying the former president. And then at the last, without spoiling the plot, I can say at the last press conference in the, in the film, where Chemisa is, is addressing uh, his voters. Uh, there's my camera crew and, and I, and, a, and, and if whatever local journalist is, is left and still have the courage to cover politics. I think there was a feeling during the, the just around the election with all these visitors, uh, foreign journalists, election observers, that, that the press could operate more freely. Uh, but then as soon as, as the result was, was given and, and everybody from outside the country had gone back home, um, the, the democratic space sort of closed down again. Um, and it's still an issue. Uh, I think even now, three years later, that, that there isn't a, a free press that's able to, to operate. Uh, um, I'm often asked about, you know, collaboration with, with local filmmakers in, in telling these stories and, and we have invited many uh, Zimbabwean filmmakers or journalists to, to, to pitch in and collaborate with us. Some have, but most are actually not um, comfortable or, or fear for their life in terms of, of reporting on politics in Zimbabwe. If you are 
have a dissenting voice if you're in, in disagreement with the government. And I think um, I saw a recent report that, that the, the, the imprisonment of critical voices and Zimbabwean journalists have greatly increased since Munangakwa took power. So in fact, some journalists are now wishing for Mugabe to come back in office, which I think says a lot about the, the current situation in terms of human rights and freedom of speech and, 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 and conditions to work from the, the press on the ground. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, well, I just have uh, one more question for you. Um, and this was kind of, when I finished the film, it was the main thing that I was thinking about. Um, throughout the film, you hear several people say, like, they are willing to die for this election to be fair and free. Um, and then we also, you know, we hear people say that, but we also kind of see it. We see the people who um, die at the hands of the military. We also hear, you know, during these affidavits, um, after the election, uh, people talk about the things that have happened to them. And in the, in the second to last scene, um, you know, you hear Nelson still being very hopeful. And, and the crowd is very hopeful that he's talking to. And so I'm just wondering where you think, um, why do you think Zimbabweans are able to maintain this level of hope despite all of what has happened um, during the course of this election and, you know, during the course of the history of the country um, and able to just find lightness when there's so, find light when there's so much darkness? Mm, I, th I think, well, it's, it's a difficult question. I think, I think in, in, in terms of the younger generation in Zimbabwe, which is Chamisa's generation, um, I think, you know, a lot of them are fed up with with the old guard, with the with with with, with the ruling party who was ruled since the, the country became independent. And I think they are looking for a change. And I think that they feel that this change is in the air. I think they were hoping that the uh, last election in 2018 was the time where change would happen. It didn't. Uh, um, uh, but I, I I believe that there is a feel in the air that that there's so little people supporting the the rural party, the the ruling party that 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 change is is within reach. If you look at the, the coming election in 2023, look at the demographics. There will be you know so many more people who have reached the age of 18, and they will support. I assume the opposition and a, and a younger candidate, they don't want to continue with, with what's going on. So I think that there is hope, real hope. Uh, and I think that's that's what he's talking about. But I also think, and without being, you know, generalistic about, you know, as a foreigner and talk about Zimbabwe as a nation or as a culture or as a people, but but I will say that there is a resilience and a resourcefulness and a a, a positivity and a, an energy in the struggle for creating a constitutional democracy in Zimbabwe that is so strong and so alive. And where that energy comes from, what, what they tap into, I, I can't explain, but I can only say that I'm in awe and I'm full of admiration for, 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 for the, especially the young activists who gets up every day, put their lives on the line, for rights and freedoms that a lot of us are lucky enough to just take for granted. Uh, so so uh, I think in that way, the film can also be a reminder for us to preserve what we have. And if our rights are at risk, uh, we can see why it's worth to, to, to fight for. Yeah. Thank you so much, Camilla. Um, this has been a great conversation and it's just been wonderful to kind of be able to speak to you about such an amazing film. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the film and the conversation and we'll see you next time.